This is Michael Scott Hollish with the Reform Report, and today I am bringing you an exclusive interview in our Organized Crime interview series with former Gambino crime family mobster Anthony Ruggiano Jr. Anthony is the son of longtime Gambino captain Fat Andy Ruggiano. This interview will touch on both Anthony's time on the street as well as some historic insight into his father. So I'm on the phone with Anthony Ruggiano Jr. He is the son of Fat Andy Ruggiano who was a uh, actually a captain in the Gambino crime family, a longtime captain, but he is really a street boss. So let, let, just to get a little bit of background on your father, and I, and I know, you know, when we've talked on the phone prior, um, you said he was a first-generation American? Yes, yes. His father came over from Naples. His mother was actually born on a potato farm in East New York, in Brooklyn, but his father immigrated from, from Naples, Italy. Mm-hmm. And um, so, so your father, obviously, was born uh, in Brooklyn? Yeah, he was born in the tenement building on Fulton Street, which is actually still there. The building is still standing. I, I, as a matter of fact, a few, a few years back, I took my two children, and we drove, actually drove past the building that he was born in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So your father, obviously, you know, uh, predates what is now known as the Gambino crime family, which was the Mangano crime family. Mangano, correct. When my father was coming up, it was called the Mangano family, exactly. When he was... Uh, essentially getting his feet wet in that life, was Anastasia already the boss of the family? Yes. Yes. He just had become the boss. Father hooked up with Charlie Wagner. Uh, Albert Anastasia was the boss of the family. But most of the people that follow uh, my interviews are, you know, people that are interested in, in mafia history. So your father at that time uh, was, uh, during that period, became essentially a member of Murder Incorporated, correct? Well, he was an, actually a member of Murder Incorporated. They already had gotten the electric chair. They already was, were executed. But he, he was actually in their neighborhood, and he took over a lot of their, their operations, but he wasn't actually a member of Murder Incorporated. But he was a member of uh, one of Albert Anastasia's main crews that did a lot of work for him. Okay, so he basically picked up where a lot of those... A lot of those uh, exactly. guys left off, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly right. Right. And obviously, you know what I what I always found interesting with Murder Incorporated is that you know there were probably it was probably more prevalent Jewish mobsters uh, than right. you know uh, in higher numbers. Italian. Right. Absolutely. Right. You yeah, know. Well, 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 Happy Bayoni. He was. He, my, my godfather, Lenny the donor, was Happy Mayoni's nephew. My godfather, Lenny, who was my father's best, one of my father's best friends, his mother, Jenny, was Happy Mayoni's sister. Matter of fact, she went to the death house and brought his body back after he was uh, executed in Sing Sing. And so, um, my father was always around him, and I actually married a Mayoni. So my father's two best friends growing up was Larry, Bacchus' father was the Dasher, who was a, murder, a member of Murder Incorporated, and his other best friend was Lenny. So when my grandfather passed away, sort of, he was mentored by these older people that were in his life. Because my grandfather was uh, was killed when my father was only eight years old. Wow. Yeah, that's that's yes. very interesting. So, so uh, when what what year was your father straightened out? Well, that's funny that you asked that because my father always told me that the best year of his life was 1953 because that was the year that he got straightened out and I was born and he became a father in the same year. Wow. He, that's, was, 20, yeah. he, was, he was 26 years old. At that point, obviously, that was still under Anastasia. Yes, Albert Anastasia straightened. As a matter of fact, the books were closed at the time and he was what they called a special case. Uh, because of the work he did, because of the murders that he committed for Albert Anastasia. So he was straightened out actually when the books were closed because of his deeds. Right. Which is, a very, which is very rare that that happens. You know, that does, it doesn't happen all the time. Right. Then. Right. Well, and not only that, it would have to be a pretty
pretty special person in that lifetime to make those right. concessions for that person, you know. Right, and Albert, Albert had a pet name for my father. He used to call my father the kid. The kid? My father always. The kid, yeah. Said right. the kid. It's called the kid. Right, right. Yeah, because, of course, back then he was so young. Did Anastasia actually straighten your dad out? Was he? No, he wasn't at the ceremony. The ca- his captain was at the ceremony. Tommy Rabbit was at the ceremony. And uh, Arnello Della Croce was at the ceremony. And Charlie Wagner was at the ceremony. Albert wasn't actually at the ceremony. He didn't, but they went to see Albert right after the ceremony was performed. Well, well, and not only that, some of those names you name obviously became very famous mob uh, figures as well. Exactly. You know. Um, exactly. Uh, and obviously, you know, uh, Neil Delacroche and, and, and also your father in an extended way were both obviously individuals that John Gotti looked up to, you know, later on. Correct. Um, oh, yeah. John Gotti was, my father was uh, one of his, uh, yeah, one of his, John was a big fan of my father's. Yeah. Right. I saw, and Jeannie Gotti used to make, Jeannie Gotti used, John's brother Jeannie used to uh, kid around me and tell me that when uh, John and him were kids and they ran into my father, they didn't know if they should shake his hands or duck. <laughs> All right. <laughs> very, very funny. And, and what's interesting, I always uh, thought, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't Gene Gotti, I think he became straightened out before John did, didn't he? Yeah, John was in prison. Yeah, Gene got straightened out first. Obviously, Gene didn't have the charisma his brother had, you know? Um, no, no. But yeah. Gene was a good guy. Gene, Gene was, a, Gene was a, a good guy. So, but Albert, but Albert Anastasia really liked my father because actually when my father was straightened out, a couple of, uh, there was other families that put a little bit of a beef in against my father to try to stop it. And they actually had to have a sit down that Albert Anastasia was actually at the sit down. He had a, they actually sat down with Albert over trying to have my father not get straightened out. Because of uh, some deeds he did, he, uh, for his, uh, he was running around and, and he was robbing uh, um, poker games and crap games. And, and um, he actually robbed some captain in the Genovese family's game. And they put a little bit of a stink in to have my father not straightened out. Right. They actually had to sit down. They actually had to sit down and, uh, and uh, with uh, Tony the Sheik, who was the captain in the Genovese family at the time. And... Uh, he told Albert that my father was an animal and he shouldn't get straightened out. And Albert actually told him, uh, well, who do you want me to straighten out, please? <laughs> and, uh, and, right, because obviously, and, yeah. that, right, because that is obviously one of the part of the protocol. They take the name and they pass it around the five families to see if there's any right. issues. That, any, and, right. Exactly. And, and of course, you know, they, Albert won the decision and my father actually was indeed straightened out. Because don't forget back then, it, it was a different world than it is today. Back then, if you didn't do, you know, it wasn't like today. You had, you know, you had to commit a murder. You had to do some work back then to actually get straightened out. It wasn't like today where, you know, it's about who brings in the most money. It's a different world today than it was when my father was in his 20s than, than it is today. Right. So that, that, that actually, that is true that initially back in, back in those days and probably a, a, a little bit after that you actually had to do some heavy work to get straightened out. Definitely. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah. Growing up now, before you got involved in organized crime, as you were growing up, were you aware that that, that your father was, you know, a gangster? Or, or did it take you well, some time to kind of figure that out? You know, I wasn't, when I was young, like when I was young, um, I was I always knew that it was. I always knew that it was different than like my cousins and my uncles and kids on my my friends on my block. Like I always knew. Like uh, my father always told me that he worked in a dry cleaners, but I always knew. It, I always knew that was true, but I didn't know actually what was going on when I was young. But I knew that you know he would take me with him on Saturdays to a bar, and all these men would cater to him, and they would give stick money in my pocket, and I always felt like kind of special. But, right. I, but I really didn't know what was going on. But when I became, I would say, when I was around 12 or 13 and I actually started, like, hanging out in the neighborhood, like, I would hang out by this pizzeria and I would hear, like, the older kids would, like, be whispering and go, that's Fatty and his son, that's Fatty and his son, don't, you know, leave him alone. That's when I started figuring out what was going on. And, 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 and when, I, when I actually started, like, hanging out in the neighborhood, like, when I got... 
and I started figuring out what's going on. And then actually, I started, he started getting some press in, and, and then I, I figured things out through kids, other people in the neighborhood. Right. But he never sat me down at that time and told me what's going on later on in life. Then him and I had some serious discussions about, you know, the, you know what was happening. But at that point, I found out basically two kids, all the guys in the neighborhood. It's a funny story because there was a lot of older guys in my neighborhood that were, like, back then they were on drugs, you know, there was a lot of, and they would come around and they would, like, take money off the young kids, off the, off the young kids, like, on the corner, they would go in their pockets and, you know, bully them and take money off them. Right. And they would, like, and, but they would always leave me alone. Absolutely. If they were smart, they, they'd get their freaking hands decapitated. Oh. Right. And they would always, they would always leave me alone, and, and that's when I started figuring things out. Right, out of, fe- out, of fear, out of fear of your father, right? Exactly, exactly. And then, and then when I got a little older, and then um, he would take me, then he started taking me, like, because John Gotti, they had the Birds and Hunt Fish Club in my neighborhood at that time, and then Cyril Perone had a club in my, so there was a lot of wise guy clubs in my, in Ozone Park at that time. They started popping up all in, in the neighborhood, like the, uh, Johnny Pinelli had a club on, on Crest Street, so what happened was he would take me with him, and he, cause I, then I started running around the neighborhood, so he would bring me, like, to these clubs, and t- bring me in and, like, say, this is my son, Anthony, and he would introduce me to them, so they saw me in the neighborhood, like, if I did anything, they wouldn't hurt me, like, right. so they would know I was his son, yeah. What time frame did you kind of start, and, and how did you initially get your feet into organized crime for yourself, you know? How, how did that happen? Well, when I, when I, when I, I, when I was 16, I got suspended from high school, and mm-hmm. uh, um, in 1969, I got suspended from high school, and my father really was very upset, he really didn't, he, he, he actually stopped talking to me, he was upset, and I called up my uncle, his older brother, my uncle Frank, and I told him, that my father doesn't want to talk to me because you come to my house. And he actually came to my house and we had a, we sat down in my kitchen and uh, my uncle Frank told my father, you know, listen, what are you going to do? He's like us. Because my uncle Frank was a Shylock. He was a, he worked in, in a train yard, but he was like a bookmaker with a Shylock. Right. And he said, you know, what are you going to do? He's like us. What are you going to do? He doesn't want to go to school no more. You know, let's put him to work. So my father looked at me and he said to me, well, do you want to go on construction? I'll get you, I'll, I'll put you in the cement mason union. And I looked at him and I said, no, I don't want to work on construction. I want to work for you. <laughs> he said, you want to work with me? I said, yeah, I want to work for you. I don't want to go lay brick. I don't want to be a brick layer. And I remember like it was yesterday, he looked at me and, and he leaned over on the table and, and he pointed his finger at me and he goes, well, I'm going to tell you right now. And then he like poked the table and he goes, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to put you to work for me. But remember, one thing, going to jail is all part of the job. That was, that was, that was my life lessons at 16. And he actually put me to work in a blackjack. He had a blackjack game on Merrick Road in Long Island with this guy that they used to call Philly the Pimp was his nickname. He wasn't actually a pimp. That was just like a nickname they gave him. I don't really know why. Right. But, uh, and I went to work in his club on Merrick Road. And, and it was a blackjack game, and I and I went to work in there. And then from there, I started working in trap games because it was a different, like I said, it was a different world back then. You know, it was before the casinos in Atlantic City. Right. So had a lot of crap games. Right, right. like a, a lot of a lot of back alley card games and dice games and stuff. Right. right. I went to I went to work for him because he, he was partners with a uh, Paulie Vario at the time, and some guys from the Bronx that had big crap games. I actually went to work in the crap game. The first crap game I worked at, I worked in the crap game with. Nikki Carrazza, Lenny Di Maria, all right. Uh, Tony Pep, Tony Pep, Santa Costa. We all worked in the this crap game on Gun Hill Road in the Bronx, and we right. used to drive up there every day together. And I was a kid; I was like 17, 18 years old at the time. Right. That was my introduction into uh, into into it. Now, now, um, didn't your father straighten Nikki and Lenny out? Correct. My father proposed Lenny. I mean right. Nikki. I'm sorry. Yeah. My father proposed uh, Nikki. And then uh, they strained out Lenny as his favor to my father on Neil Delacroix. Vicky was my father's protege. Vicky was my father's guy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, Nikki, Nikki stood by my father's side till uh, the bitter end. Back then, he was never left my father's side. Right. So he was, uh, was he uh, in your father's crew then? Yeah, when he was a teenager, they started. They, they, they started. My father. They, they were my father when they were teenagers. They were kids. In East New York. 
Right. My father was still, even though my, we lived in Ozone Park, my father still hung out in East New York. My father had a club on Easter Parkway in Atlantic Avenue and he had a bar called the Back Page on Easter Parkway in Atlantic Avenue in the 50s and the 60s. So uh, Lenny and Nikki and Lenny and them started hanging out with my father in the 50s, in the, in the late 50s, right after my father got straightened out. Right, yeah, yeah, Nick, yeah, those guys go way back. Yeah, they were teenagers. Yeah, right. They were kids, yeah, they were kids when they started hanging. They, they were robbing, uh, they were breaking into jukeboxes in the neighborhood. Right. <laughs> and, my, and my father, uh, actually, my father, actually, Mikey Gow, Tony Lee Guerrero's brother, Mikey, he actually brought Nicky to my father when Nicky was a kid, because my father knew Nicky's uncle, Cowboy. My father did time with Cowboy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, years before that, so he knew the Carrazza family, but he just didn't know Nikki. But he knew Nikki's father and Nikki's uncle. And Mikey Gal brought Nikki to my father, and my father put Nikki to work. And right. How, and then Nikki in turn brought Lenny and JoJo and all of them. So Nikki was involved before JoJo was, huh? Yeah, Nikki brought them all around after he went to work for my father. Then Nikki right. started, then Nikki brought this guys who all the all those guys around. Right. right. You know, it, it, it's interesting, like, you know, the guys from your father's era, you know, that the guys that were, you know, under them all ended up becoming powerful guys, you know. Um, Very powerful, you, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think I even think of, like, Nino Gaggi, you know, Roy DeMeo was, right. Roy DeMeo was under him at one point, you know. And then, Roy, yeah, you know, yeah, Roy DeMeo, yeah, I, know, I met him. I, 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 he was very, very good friends with my father, Roy. I right. remember when Roy used to come into the Raven Night when I was a kid. Would come into the Raven Night and everybody would stop talking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very interesting. But, uh, but uh, yeah, back then, you know, when that's when this was going on, and when I started coming around in the '60s, the, you know, my father actually had, had one of the biggest crews in New York. I mean, for, for a wise guy to have a crew of he had over 70, 80 guys around him that were, that were just all associates at the time because the books were closed. So he had a very, very big pool. My father, I mean, they had, they, they were, you know, they, and they were into a lot of, a lot of stuff, crap games and, and, and numbers and bookmaking and Shylock and, you know, uh, hijacking. And I mean, there's just so much stuff was going on back then. Absolutely. And well, and then like, like, you know, obviously Paul Vario, you know, his crew was really big in the hijacking as well, you know, so they probably, you know, when you have friends that are, you know, do jobs with them, you know, and you split, split up the goods or do, you yeah. know, whatever. Yeah, my, right. My father was very, very good friends with the drivers. He was good friends with, uh, with all these brother babies who died of cancer. They were like always together. Mm-hmm. My father was very, my father used to take me by Paulie's house when I was a kid. Take me there on Sunday mornings because they used to, they used to go there to straighten out with all the over there crap games and a lot of stuff. And I remember when I was a little kid, he would take me by Tony Dario's house on a Sunday in Canarsie, and I would go there and play in his living room with his kids or his grandkids. I don't even remember how they were back then. It was so long ago, but I used to go to his house on, I remember it was a Sunday morning. He used to go there. The legendary guys, you know, for sure. Yeah. 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 When my father was away in Missouri, my father was away in Springfield, Missouri, absolutely with Paulie, and we would all fly out there together. Me and Tony Lee, Danny Cateo, and Paulie's sons, we all would fly out to Springfield together to mm-hmm. visit them. Yeah, very interesting. So around 69, you started kind of getting your feet wet and, and working the card games up for your dad. So from there, did things just kind of progress where you had you start, you know, just kind of bringing you up and kind of grooming you into, you know, moving into different avenues or? Yeah, he would started telling me, he started telling me who was who, explaining to me, you know, who was who, you know, who did what, like things he did, personal things that he did, and who was who, like he would point guys out to me, that guy's a wise guy, that guy, and he would tell me things they did and, uh, he would, you know, he started explaining a lot of stuff to me and telling me a lot of stuff at that time. Right, trying to educate you on the life, right. Exactly, exactly, exactly. You know, when I was doing my own thing too, I had a couple, you know, I was hanging out with some good kids back at the, back then, you know. Um, my, my, uh, Le- Lenny the Dones, my father's godson, Joey, little Joe, who I passed away, I hung out with, you know, I had a, a couple of good guys with me, Robert Angle was hanging out with me, Ronnie one arm. you know, we were all kids together, we all hung out together. Right. We started doing our own thing. We were taking numbers and we were selling, uh, selling swag, and you know we were out trying to make some money, make a name for ourselves. So at the point that uh, uh, Carlo Gambino.
Gambino passed away, and obviously the the family went to Paul Castellano. What was your father's relationship with Castellano? Like, how, how did he did he think that that should have gone that way, or was he kind of? No, he was upset when it first time. He was very upset that he he always he always felt that Neil should have declared himself the boss. He always felt that Neil should have declared himself the boss and made everybody captains right away, and and he should have took over the family that well, had no business being the boss. He never he never was happy with that decision, and he always he had, he had even had a little resentment with Neil because my father always felt that that crew in the in the Ravenite like. Neil's guys like my father and Charlie and John and Frankie Martin and all them guys deserved to have the power. Right, right. Where, where it's like it's kind of like you know I I, I see both sides of it because obviously Neil is old school and he you know I guess he That's just res- respected what uh, Carlos wishes were. Uh, Carlos yeah. wishes, correct? Yeah, right. Right. And all- they were surprised. And they were surprised because Neil was the gangster. And my father was a gangster, and John Gotti was a gangster. So they just figured that the gangster thing to do would, would be to corral the family, and they all felt that that's what Neil should have done. Right, and, 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 and uh, there's no doubt, there's no doubt in my mind that if my father or John or any one of them were in that position, it would have been a different story. There was, there's no doubt in my mind about any of that. Right. You well, know, and, and and that is and family. that is what ultimately happened once Neil passed away. I mean, although John John's back was against the wall because Paul was, you know, right. going to basically, you know, kill his brother and 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 exactly. and, and uh, Angelo. Um, correct, exactly. But uh, but my father, but my father did get along with Paul. You know, my father always told me that Albert Anastasia was the toughest guy he ever met, and Carl was Gambino was the smartest guy he ever met. He right. always told me those about things about those two guys. And right. So moving forward, now when, Carl, when 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 Paul became the boss, my father went to see him, and he sent for my father to discuss the tapers union, and uh, and he asked my father what the arrangement was, and my father told him what the arrangement was, and Paul was a little surprised, and Paul gave my father a better deal as far as the union, the tapers union was concerned. He upped the ante for my father, who was actually taking care of the whole union. Well, and not only that, you know, Paul Paul obviously felt like, you know, hey, this guy could have basically told me anything, you know, and, um... And, and, right, and Paul wanted to make friends, Paul wanted to, you know, keep the peace, and, you know, Paul, you know, knew my father was an old-timer, you know, he, you know, he, he, he actually came to my wedding call, he came to my wedding, my first wedding, when I actually married, I married a Mayone, I married Happy Mayone's great niece, and, uh, Paul actually came to my wedding and gave me, uh... Five hundred dollars for a wedding gift back in 1977. Even, even, even the guy, the new movie that just came out, um, the Irishman. Yes. So the part that Joe Pesci plays, Buffalino. Oh, uh, Russell Buffalino, guy, right? Right. He came to my wedding. My father was my father was very very good friends with him. He came to my wedding. Yeah, he came to my wedding in '77. So I had a big I had a big wedding. I had over a thousand people at my wedding. I got envelopes from all over the country. I got envelopes from Chicago, Buffalo. Joe Dutera, the boss of Buffalo, sent me an envelope. Uh, Buffalino came to my wedding. Paul Castellano was at my. I mean, everybody was at my wedding. It was it was a big uh, big affair. Right. Well, it's uh, the pay respect to your father as well. You know, I mean, exactly. that, that's a exactly. big that's a big uh, event, and uh, uh, that's very interesting. You know, and, and to think of some of those people. I mean, Russell Buffalino was very powerful. And uh, we used to go. We used to go out there on Christmas. We used to have a big Christmas party. We used to go to. Matter of fact, the last time I went there, Tony Bennett sang at the Christmas party. Very cool. Yeah. 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 Now, did your father ultimately did he, did he did he uh, end up running a crew for the Gambinos down here in Florida? Well, he had guys around him. That that what happened was he um he came down here and um uh, he came down here. By himself at first, but he brought guys with him that were guys that were with him. And then what happened was there was a crew down here. Tommy Agro, Agro's crew had a, he had a crew down here with, uh, with a, a, lot, a couple of guys. And Joe Dallow, who was the counselor the area at the time, asked my father to do him a favor and to take care of all Tommy's guys down here. So he hooked up with Tommy down here and they started doing some stuff down here. And, every, and ultimately, that's how he got. That was his demise because that's how we got lined up getting arrested down in Florida. Mm-hmm. 
Right. Yeah. What and and what was the um is a very intriguing thing. Did your, did your and and I don't know how much is fact or fiction, but did your father actually um kind of like ingratiate himself and kind of blend in with the Hell's Angels for a while to to get right. a. So this is what this is what happened when he was a fugitive. He it was a motorcycle guy. He wasn't a Hell's Angels guy. It was it was a motorcycle club that had a bar in it. Mm-hmm. And my father grew a beer, and and he, and he he used to go in there during the day and drink. He used to just go in there by himself and sit at the bar. And the motorcycle gang sort of knew what was going on. They like sort of just left him alone, and he was just going there and have a few drinks and sitting there, and you know, and just uh, just to get out of the house, just to break up the monotony. And but he's trying to blend in. You know, he grew his hair long. He grew a beard. Right. He's in his mug shot there, yeah. so he tried to like blend in to how they looked. Mm-hmm. But he, it wasn't actually Hell's Angels, but it was a motorcycle gang, but it wasn't a Hell's Angels clubhouse. It was another clubhouse. And they sort of just left him alone. Like, they sort of got the vibe that something was up with him. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and he used to go in there and drink. Yeah. Right. So he wasn't actually riding motorcycles or some motorcycle club. No, no, Okay, no, okay. Because I'm, like, no, trying to no. picture your father riding a motorcycle with a bunch of, no, you know, outlaw bikers, you know. He did try, he did try to emulate their look that was about it you know okay right and and smart too i mean you know that's you know you got for sure in that situation as you were coming up were you always in your father's crew underneath your father yes okay right and now at any time were was it ever discussed for you to be proposed uh, to get straightened out? Oh uh, yeah, my name my name went around twice. My name went around twice. It's, it's sort of ironic because every time I was on the verge of getting straightened out, I, I would get I got arrested. Actually, in '04, mm-hmm. when I got out of prison in '04, I actually met with Lenny Di Maria, and Lenny Di Maria and uh, told me that uh, my name went around, that everything was okay. I could actually had the authority to okay to actually sit down with other wise guys that I was going to be considered a wise guy. The only thing that, that didn't happen yet was the ceremony and that was going to take place like within a few months. Right. And then, um, that was in, that, that, no, it wasn't in 04. That was in the beginning, that was around in the mid beginning of 05, that conversation I had with him. And then I actually went out for dinner with brother and a couple of guys and uh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Boy and uh, who was the acting captain at the time. And uh, they started telling me who was who, who the new captains were and who, the, who got strengthened out. And, and uh, that I, I, if I needed to go sit down with anybody, I could go on my own. I didn't need any of them to come with me. That the word was out that, uh, that I should be respected as a wise guy. They just didn't have the ceremony yet. I was just waiting for the ceremony to happen. I had a co- another conversation with Lenny Di Maria, and he told me that um, I was the, the ceremony was going to take place around right before Christmas. This was in, in June, mm-hmm. um, and I got arrested. I got arrested for, for I got arrested for the mur- for murder. Right. We go with a murder, and I got arrested, and then the rest is history. And I never got I never actually had the ceremony, and here we are having this conversation. Right. Years later. Yeah. Right. Well, so in in on the, on that charge, was that the one that uh, uh, dealt with your was it your father's brother in law that that no, was my brother in law my, my, my father's son in law. Oh, okay, my okay. That that was my that. Father's right. That situation, which which stemmed was that did that stem from uh, from what I read? What did your mother get thrown down some steps or something? Or? No, he was uh, choking my mother. My my wife. Alice, we lived upstairs at the time. She actually ran down, and he was choking my mother, and she actually jumped on it and started scratching his face to get him off my mother, and then he just ran out of the house. But he was actually just beating on my mother. And at that point, your father was in prison, right? My father was in prison, right. My father right. was in prison. And I, was, I, was, I, actually, I actually was in treatment at the time. I was in Vermont. Right. Yeah, so uh, so I found out the next day, after, because it was, it was the night of my baby shower and uh, the next day when I called up my wife Alice to find out how to baby shower when she actually told me what happened and then when I got out of when I came home from Vermont you know I went to see Tony Lee and uh, that's when the ball started rolling as far as my brother was concerned mm-hmm. but you know I was all caught up in, you know at, at that point in time 
time, you know, the mob was like, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was, I was in a thousand percent. Like my father believed in this wholeheartedly. Like, you know, it was, it was you know, it was every fabric, you know, every fabric of his being, he believed in, in the mob, in the mob. I mean, he was through and through. Right. And at that time, I was too. As the years went on after that incident, as the years went on. Then I started seeing, like, when I was away and things started happening when I was away and I started feeling differently about things, like, I started seeing the abnormal side of it, like, you know, like, you know, fathers don't tell their sons to go commit murders. Right. Or, 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 you know, I, I interviewed a gentleman who, uh, whose father and uncle were both made, made members of the outfit and, uh, and his dad actually put a hit out on him, on his own son. Yeah. I have to say one thing. Nobody ever loved me like he loved me. Like he loved me. Like no, like he used to kiss me on my lips when he saw me. Like he loved me. Right. Like nobody like we. You know he told me everything about him. Like we we had no secrets. You know. Uh, but at the end, you know it just was just what we we you know we were wrong. You know we were right. wrong. You right. Know, the way we lived was not it's not normal. It's just wrong. I mean look at the. Look at the devastation of our families today. I mean, you know. Right, not just the victims, you know, but of, of you, of all of you guys, right? Exactly. Absolutely. I mean, look right. at the hurt. I mean, the mother, you know, like, the, yeah, the victims' families and, 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 and our own families. I mean, look at the devastation. I mean, every, you know, it's, um, right. it's tough. It's, you know, it's a, it's a tough way to go. And, you know, once my father died, you know, it was a different story with all these, you know, so-called friends. I mean, my mother got, my mother... For God's sake, just get meals on wheels. Right, that's the thing. It's, you see how real people are when the situation changes. Exactly.